Dr. Reinhardt is Professor of Economics and Director of the Center for International Economics at the University of Maryland. Uh, after receiving her PhD uh, from Columbia University, she held positions as Chief Economist and Vice President of the investment firm Bear Stearns in the 1980s, where she became interested in financial crises, international contagion, and commodity price cycles. Uh, she moved from the investment banking world to the policy arena as she spent some time at the International Monetary Fund. And currently, she is a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research, a research fellow at the Center for Economic Policy Research, and a member of the, on the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, Dr. Reinhardt has served on uh, many boards, panels, and has testified before the U.S. Congress. She has written, published in leading scholarly journals on a variety of topics in macroeconomics and international finance and trade, including uh, international capital flows, exchange rates, inflation and commodity prices, banking and sovereign debt crises, and currency crashes. Uh, for the last decade, uh, Dr. Reinhardt has helped to inform the understanding of financial crises, crises in particular. Uh, in the early 1990s, she wrote about the fickleness of capital flows after, uh, uh, to emerging markets and the likelihood of abrupt reversals, and this was prior to the Mexican crisis of the mid-1990s. Uh, prior to the Asian crisis of the late 1990s, she documented the international historical links between asset price bubbles uh, and banking crises and how the latter could lead to currency crashes. And of more recent note, she identified the possibility of severe economic dislocations from the 2007 uh, subprime crisis. Uh, given the quality and poignancy of her work, is frequently, frequently featured in the global financial press. Now, her latest book is co-authored with Kenneth Rogoff and entitled, This Time is Different, Eight Centuries of Financial Folly. It documents similarities of the recurring booms and busts that have characterized financial history and is the subject of her Summerlin Lecture. As evidence of the book's influence, it has been translated into 13 languages, but I understand tonight's talk will be in English. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Carmen Reinhardt. Uh, well, thank you for, for inviting me. It's my pleasure to be here. Uh, what I'd like to do is um, give a brief overview of some of the themes of the book as it relates to current events and um, leave plenty of time for Q&A. Some of the um, uh, very recent work that I referred to in connection with bringing the talk up to speed in terms of where we are in the recovery from financial crisis is also based on some recent work that I did called After the Fall, which was presented um, at the Jackson Hole uh, Conference, which the Federal Reserve sponsors annually. Um, Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City. Now, let me start by just sort of preventing a broad brush view of where this crisis that we've had fits in history. And this chart that I'm showing here, what it does is it takes, the, the period is from 1900 to 2010. The blue line is uh, a sum of different kinds of economic crises. We, ha we can have uh, banking crises, inflation crises, currency crashes, sovereign default on domestic debt, sovereign default on external debt. Those are the five crises that sort of are the backbone of our analysis. That's the blue line. And the blue line basically takes these five crises for the 66 countries in our sample. And so if a country, so, so let me give you a profile of what the height of the crisis in 2008 looked like. In 2008, there were no really major inflation crises in the countries. You know, it's not. Uh, there were no sovereign defaults, either on domestic debt or foreign debt. But in the advanced economies, you had an outbreak, literally, of banking crises. And in the advanced economies, and in the emerging markets, you had an outbreak of currency crashes in the fall of 2008. 
where currency after currency crashed against the dollar. So basically, you know, with the exception of the yen, the Swiss franc, and the Chinese yuan, you had major currency. So, so the spike that you see there in 2008 in the blue line is a combination of a lot of banking crises in Europe, in the United States, and also uh, currency crashes across the world. Now, the red line adds equity market crashes to the picture. So it takes the same five crises and then adds on top of that uh, equity market crashes. Um, why do I want to show this? I want to show this for two reasons. The first reason is when, you know, it is no exaggeration when the financial press refers to this crisis as the worst crisis since we've had since the Depression. Uh, advanced economies had not synchronously had a crisis like this post-World War II, period. Um, there were severe financial crises in the Nordic countries, in Norway in 87, in Sweden, Finland in 1991, in Japan in 1992, in Spain in 77, but that's it. The advanced economies had not seen anything like this uh, in the post-World War II. Um, so first point, this is really more about a pre pre-war uh, order of magnitude. The second point that I want to make in this graph is that notwithstanding, okay, you know, I, I, I'm prone to gesturing, so I can blind somebody if I use this, you know, I have to be very careful. Um, uh, you know, notwithstanding this, this spike that you see here, that spike is emerging market crises of the 80s and 90s. First in the 80s, it was the highly indebted countries, mostly in Latin America, but not exclusively. And then in the 1990s, it was a breakdown of the former Soviet Republic and Eastern Europe. So you had a lot of emerging market crises. But again, um, the last three years have been uh, unprecedented in the post-World War II period. To highlight that this is not some construct of, of our crisis definition. Just take a good look. This is world exports. This is, you know, no, this is now all the countries, world exports. And the red line is the mean for um, the uh, full period, and the little dashes are, you know, putting bands and you know, it, I think the chart speaks for itself. You have to go back to the crash in world trade uh, after 1929 to get something of comparable magnitude to uh, what we see here. Now, let me, let me add a remark on this. You know, we're hearing a lot now about currency wars and trade wars. Okay, so the first spike down here that you see in the Depression is largely a function of output just imploding uh, across the world. You know, as 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 the you have banking crisis after banking crisis, country defaulting, you know, very severe declines in output. But this persistence in the downturn here is also reinforced by trade wars. Okay, no, notice here we're spiking back. Hopefully, we won't spike back down. Um, but, but again, to reiterate the main point, I don't want to dwell on it. You know, I, I want to manage my time so that I can tell the full story. Uh, but this is where this crisis fits. It's no exaggeration by the financial press to call it, you know, the, the worst crisis since the Depression. Now, I'm going to divide the rest of my talk into three parts, causes, of the crisis, and sort of give a little bit of a timeline. I'm not, I'm not going to go through, there are many causes, and uh, each crisis is different. It has its own element, but by the way, the title of the book this time is different. It's meant to be ironic, okay? Uh, <laughs> just to clarify. And so what we focus throughout is on the common causes. You know, what are the same patterns that we see again and again in our data? 
uh, going back very far into earlier crisis. So I'm going to talk about causes. I'm going to talk then about the part that probably most of you are interested in, which is also the aftermath. And in the context of the aftermath, there's the two parts. One is sort of the more immediate consequences of a financial crisis, and then there are the longer run consequences, which deep financial crises cast a long shadow, okay? They're not something that you, you it's not a normal recession, you know? And, and, and believe me, the amount of incredulous response that Ken and I have had to deal with in the last few years when we said, you know, financial crisis, you really, it's not looking at your average United States post-World War II recession. The duration was less than a year. The longest one had been 16 months. This one surpassed that, okay? Um, and by many standards, it's still not over, which I will talk about. Okay, so common causes. So I always feel compelled to have a, a, a chart that is difficult to read. It's just sort of a, a, a standard. Uh, and so the small writing, it, it, you know, please take this as a broad brush view of the time temporal sequencing, okay, of how things evolve. This is not etched in stone. Not every crisis, for example, this one has not had an inflationary pickup. Neither did the Great Depression, on the contrary, deflation was a problem. But most of the, you know, so this is the most common pattern. And I will highlight where the current crisis deviates from the current pattern. But the common pattern begins with a financial liberalization or a financial innovation. In the context of the current crisis, um, the securitization of mortgages played a big role, okay? So that, it, the, but the essence of financial liberalization or financial innovation more broadly is that it makes a lot of credit available to segments of the economy that did not have access to credit before. In the, in the, cur in the, in the current context, uh, and as I will note, uh, a common uh, pattern is that the credit boom that we get, we get booms in asset prices, in real estate, in housing prices. This is not, I'm not saying this a seat of the pants. This is stuff we go out and document with data for, you know, crisis after crisis. So this is not sort of a oh, let me extrapolate from the current crisis. This is stuff we document. Uh, then the boom in credit and asset prices, as the boom proceeds, the quality of the lending inevitably deteriorates. And you start seeing banking sector problems emerge. Okay? Now here, because I've been, you know, my morbid fascination with crisis is very old. Uh, so, you know, I've been with my uh, co-author Graciela Kaminsky, we also, you know, had a paper called the Twin Crises, which looked at how a banking crisis can also lead to a currency collapse, which is in effect pretty much what we saw in the UK. Here is departure number one for the US. The US actually, during the height of the crisis, because the US dollar is the reserve currency, and a good chunk of Europe is also mired in crisis. And the euro and the sustainability of the euro is called into question. You had a flight into the dollar at the height of the crisis. That's not the common. That, that is really quite unique to the current crisis. The most common outcome is what we saw. How many of you followed, I know you were probably in diapers and such, but you know, you followed the Asian crisis. Okay, well, the, the Asian crisis was in the context of, you know, Indonesia and Rupiah falling by 80%, the bot, you know, by comparable amounts, the yuan, and so on. And that's a common pattern. Uh, and because you get currency crashes that are big, normally you do get some inflationary pickup. Okay? Um, so often the currency crash you know, especially emerging markets borrow a lot in foreign currencies. 
And so the currency crash actually makes the debt problem worse. And you get into an even sort of vicious cycle in which the banking crisis becomes worse. In the current context, uh, what makes the crisis worse over time is that the deterioration in economic activity that goes on through here, because throughout here, this is recession time. And this is something, again, we document. I'm not just saying it based on the current experience. But the recession makes the, the uh, problem worse of non-performing loans, so the crisis in the banking system worsens. Um, and this is the big contentious part, which earlier this year, how many of you were interested in following, for example, what was going on with Greece? OK, well, you know, the, the, the move from banking to default is not a coincidence. Uh, one of the things we document is that fiscal finances deteriorate a lot because of a banking crisis. And this is, you know, forget the sort of, you know, big headlines of bailout or stimulus, even without stimulus, even without bailout. Uh, the collapse in fiscal revenues that typically accompanies a banking crisis worsens your deficits, leads to big pickup in, in debt. And debt is going to be a big theme in my talk. OK. Now, periods of high capital mobility have also uh, been uh, associated with banking crises. I'm not gonna. I'm not. I'm gonna skim through some of the material because I really want to allow for questions. But the story is one still about debt. High capital mobility makes borrowing from abroad easier. And if you look at the countries that have had big crises recently, Iceland, U.S., Ireland, U.K., Spain, Greece. Uh, these are banking crises. I'm not talking about sovereign crises, in which would be Greece. Uh, banking crises all had massive capital inflows. In other words, borrowing from the rest of the world. There's a, a big debt buildup. Um, so let me just say one diagnosis of the crisis is that you know easy money, the availability of lots of credit, and this is not just about easy monetary policy domestically, but also the availability of being able to borrow from abroad. Easy money is a great cause of overborrowing. And that's a good characterization from you know, a lot of the crises we've had. However, this characterization comes from Irving Fisher in 33. So you, you can see we're not reinventing the wheel here uh, in terms of, of, of the nature of what we've observed. And just very briefly, I'm going to summarize the antecedents of the crisis and move on to the aftermath. Uh, leading indicators of banking crisis historically have been the financial innovation, availability of, of credit, large capital inflows, which means you have big current account deficits, which means you're borrowing from abroad. Uh, the big Availability of credit leads to booms in housing and equity prices. You get good growth. This, in English, this means that you know you have good growth and then followed by recession, and importantly, a marked rise in indebtedness. This is a, a housing price boom. Here is you know how much the ones in red are all the countries that have had crises. And these are the percent increases in housing prices uh, in the early 2000s to 2006 before the crisis hit. Now, I'm not going to go through all of the uh, um, slides, but let me highlight that these factors that I discussed in the previous slide as causes also get magnified, amplified by pro-cyclical uh, borrowing by, by governments. And here I'm not talking actually, in, in the case of the US, it was the states. If you look at uh, during the boom years, the states you know, spent a lot 
and and uh, in many emerging markets, uh, con you know, governments borrow when the going's good, and so the it, the boom bust is exacerbated by by uh, government borrowing. Um, Implicit guarantees, hidden debts, I cannot stress the importance of that enough. If you look at our work, a lot of what we do is also try to um, look at, you know, some potential indicators of how big the hidden debts are. Um, you know, sometimes the debts are, the hidden debts are not that hidden. I mean, before the crisis, Fannie and Freddie were seen largely as government completely guaranteed debt. And central banks across the world treated it as such. And ex post, they turned out to be right. Because now, Fannie and Freddie are explicitly part of the government debt, um, government enterprise debt. Uh, so implicit guarantees are a big, a big deal in these crises. Uh, poor regulation, supervision problems, so, as I mentioned earlier, the quality in lending declines. Um, what about the aftermath, which is where we are now? Um, well, I'm not going to go through. There's just lots of things I could talk about, but I'm going to focus on two areas that are of particular resonance. Uh, equity markets can crash, as they did in 2008 and in the first half of 2009, but recover. They tend to recover more quickly. Okay, so declines can be quite abrupt, but recoveries also can be quite abrupt as well. Uh, GDP growth can, can also fall off quite sharply and then, you know, recover. But the two markets that are really sluggish are housing and employment. And that's what I'm focusing here because the, these cast a long shadow after the crisis. So what the panel here in the left shows, it is the left, right? OK. Um, is the magnitude of the decline in housing prices peak to trough for some of the worst crises post-World War II. So your average decline in real housing prices is about 36%, which is actually right on the money in terms of how much the Case-Shiller Index in the United States has declined. That's a huge decline in real housing prices. And the, the issue with housing is that the cycles are long. So on average, it's six years of decline, okay? Later on, I'm gonna show that also, even when they do recover, the full recovery to pre-crisis levels takes much, much longer. This is just declining, okay? So it's a long cycle. And uh, just very quickly, what this shows here is the frequency distribution of house prices in the 10 years after a severe crisis. This means prices are higher than before the crisis. This means that prices are lower than before the crisis. Bottom line, most of the observations, as you see, in the decade, decade after the financial crisis, involve lower housing prices. That is, it's a very sluggish recovery. Let me put it this way. If you really want to get depressed, look at Japan. Japan hasn't had a single increase in housing prices in any given year since 1992 when the banking crisis began. And that's an extreme case, okay? But it, nonetheless, the other market that is very slow to recover, and it's not uncorrelated with what I just said, is employment. Unemployment rates, and this, Ken and I did a paper called The Aftermath of Financial Crisis, which was published in the American Economic Review. Uh, and we presented this in the uh, American Economic Association meetings in January of 2009 and said, look, in the worst crises, unemployment on average increases by seven percentage points. And it was thought to be very, you know, wow, this is perhaps they're really looking at crises that are not relevant or it, it's, it's, 
what we tried to highlight, this is not even an emerging market. Some of the worst unemployment increases actually are in crises in advanced economies. Similarly, also, the unemployment has a long uh, duration, the cycle. And this is now from the work that I presented. So at the Jackson Hole Conference, the Kansas City Fed Jackson Hole Conference, end of August, Chairman Bernanke, as always, you know, the chairman of the Fed, opens the remarks. And he gave sort of a more upbeat assessment of the economy. The second presenter was, you know, myself in this presenting this paper called After the Fall. And what basically the paper showed was that, you know, the time for optimism may come, but maybe now wasn't it. Uh, because the... Uh, if you, the basic exercise that we're doing in this paper, this is a paper with Vincent Reinhardt, this is not a paper with Ken uh, Rogoff, uh, it's, a, it's we look at the decade after severe financial crisis and compare it to the decade before the crisis. And we say, okay, what is the difference in growth, unemployment, housing, um, and what is sort of the driver? What does credit and leverage do? What is the, the, the pattern? And I will talk more about that in a minute. But what is shown here is basically the uh, unemployment rate for the period before the crisis, the 10 years before the crisis. For these are for the worst. Financial crisis, this is just advanced economies here. And then for the 10 years after. And what you basically see is that unemployment rate, uh, median unemployment rates are five percentage points higher in the decade after the crisis. So, you know, housing price weakness persists, unemployment persists. Uh, growth is not as stark a difference but growth is about one percentage point lower in the decade after the crisis than in the decade before. Now, importantly, one of the things that we argue is that the pre-crisis uh, growth performance is importantly driven by people taking on debt. If you look at the decade before the crisis, not just in the United States, but Pick, pick your country, Spain, UK, uh, uh, Ireland. It, what you see are huge increases in debt, which we document. This is domestic debt, household debt, firms debt. The pickup in household debt was importantly sharp around uh, this crisis. And those debts do not unwind quickly. That is, it takes... On average, in the sample that we looked at, which are you know 15 severe post World War II crises, it takes on average about seven years to deleverage for the private sector. Um, but as economic conditions are weaker, uh, the fiscal consequences are significant. So one of the things that we wrote about, this is in the, in the book and in, in, in our early work, is that on average, government debts, this is now, this is not debt as a percent of GDP, okay? This is, this is just straight government debt deflated, you know, by, by the price level. Uh, but the bottom line is government debt nearly doubles. It increases by about 86% in the three years after uh, of a financial crisis. So the consequences uh, have, you know, cast a long shadow. And this, historically, historically, the deterioration in fiscal uh, finances, in, in, in deficits and debt, have often uh, led to a higher incidence of financial crisis of going from a financial crisis to a debt crisis, an outright sovereign debt crisis. Um, this is public debt to GDP for Greece. For We actually have it 
going back to pre-independence uh, in the 1820s for external debt, but for domestic debt, we only have it beginning in 1848. But importantly, the shaded lines is the years that the country has been in a state of default or restructuring. About 48% of the observations since independence, Greece has been in a state of default or restructuring. So, you know, the um, near default here is not a new phenomenon. I mean, we've just forgotten that these things happened. It's, uh, so, so, you know, like in, in one of the chapters of the book, we open it by um, the quote from, um, um, you know, um, Rose Bertan saying, there is nothing new except what is forgotten. Uh, Rose Bertan wasn't talking about financial crashes. She was the couturier of Marie Antoinette. She was talking about fashions and uh, things that people forget, but they come back. But it, so it is with financial crises. Um, Kindleberger, in his wonderful history of, of, of financial crisis, called him a hardy perennial. Um, and so what this chart here shows, this is a calculation of public or central government debt, to be more accurate. Central government debt as a percent of GDP is the blue line. And the yellow shading is the percent of countries that are in default or restructuring. Historically, such high incidence of government debt worldwide has been associated with a higher incidence of default or restructuring. Uh, and the more recent default episodes were in the 80s and 90s strictly emerging markets. But in the 30s, defaults spanned advanced economies and emerging markets. Uh, so, so that's just you know one of the uplifting uh, tidbits from the analysis. Uh, as regards the very long shadow that financial crises uh, cast. And so there are issues also pertaining to uh, debt and growth. You know, besides, so, so let, us, let us say that no one is concerned about a US default, which seems like a reasonable assumption, OK? Uh, or no one is concerned about a UK default which seems like a reasonable assumption. Uh, what about does high government indebtedness coupled, especially, with high private indebtedness? So you're really dealing with a very high leverage situation. How, what does that imply for growth? One of the findings we have from a related paper called Growth in a Time of Debt in growth in a time of debt, let me just describe, because I want to leave plenty of time for, for Q&A, so you guys can wave me down when I should be. OK. <laughs> All right. OK. Uh, so, so is that no, that you won't wave me down, or that? I'm not going to stop. Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what we did here is, uh, this is a very like straight kind of you know straight question one would ask is we have constructed for you know we began with 66 countries and we've expanded the data to cover 70 countries we've constructed debt to GDP series uh, in some cases going back to the 1600s you know but those are the fewer uh, then for a good chunk we have debt beginning somewhere in the 1860s to 1880s. And then for another huge chunk, we have debt going back to 1913. Um, and so we said, let's just do a plain vanilla exercise in which we take government debt as a percent of GDP and divide it up into four buckets, 0 to 30%, 30 to 60%, 60 to 90, and above 90 and just look at median growth rates and average growth rates, GDP growth rates, during years in which debt was, you know, 30 to 90 or, you know, 90, above 90 or whatever. 
And that's the exercise that, that we did. And um, um, we, uh, you know, have a lot of observations because we have, you know, l very long time series. We also did, you know, we separated advanced economies from emerging markets. We looked at pre World War II, post World War II, but we, so, but the the exercise is very plain vanilla. You know, it's very very simple. Um, and uh, we uh, uh, find that f for low levels of debt, and low is generously defined, for levels of debt below 90%, there is actually no relationship between debt and growth. You know, I will show you the chart, you can, but you can see that the, the, there's no statistically significant difference in median growth rates or average growth rates. For debts that are above 90%, you get significantly lower growth rates with median growth rates falling by 1% and average growth rates falling by even more, okay? Um, so the um, question is, you know, why 90%, you know? There are, have been studies that have been done quite recently, meaning in the last couple of months since we did this, that have also tried to refine the issue of threshold. And the, the main thrust of that work is that some are finding thresholds that are somewhat lower, you know, beginning in the 70s, 75, 80 uh, percent range. We did it because we wanted to be symmetric. You know, we said 0 to 30, 30 to 60, 60 to 90, and above 90, not because there's anything magic above 90. Let me say one thing about 90%, though, which is observations, if you do a histogram, okay, of all the observations, the tail, the upper tail of that distribution where, where debt's, debt to GDP is higher than 90%, is very small. So, you know, less than 8% of all observations are at debt levels that are that high, which means if debt level, if, if countries, you know, and authorities were not worried about high debt levels, having some sort of, you know, difficult, raising some difficult choices, you would expect to see, you know, a higher incidence of, of, uh, of, of higher debts. This is just the bar chart that highlights what I just said. Um, but the reason I want to show it anyway, even though I've already talked about the results, it also shows results for inflation, okay? So the bars um, are average and median growth rates. This is, I'm showing here the advanced economies. I will talk also about our findings for emerging market for which we did uh, a comparable exercise. And none of these are statistically, you know, there's no significant difference. Um, the blue line, and this was surprising to us, because the next question was, well, what about inflation? What happens with inflation when you have high debt? Our expectation was that we were going to find that higher debt levels are associated systematically with higher inflation rates. That was our expectation, but it turned out actually not to be true, because none of these are statistically, if, you know, if I were to put the standard errors around this, none of them are, are significant different they are for emerging markets so this is the same exact graph okay except instead of for advanced economies for emerging markets the story about growth is ditto it's the same but the story about inflation is actually closer to what we had expected at which at high levels of government debt you get lower growth higher inflation rates uh, for the emerging markets we also did this exercise for external debt. And external debt has bigger teeth, so that thresholds in which growth starts to decline for emerging markets is lower. So you start seeing growth really decline at levels of 60% of GDP. This is for, for emerging markets of external debt, which sort of stands to reason because a lot of the you know, the lion's share, if not all of the external debts are denominated in foreign currency. 
Uh, so servicing those debts, especially as your currency depreciates, uh, you know, carries, you know, a, a big burden. It's not something you can... Um, okay, so let me say something about external debt, and then I'm going to sort of turn to where do I see the financial uh, regulation, financial architecture, big picture, where are we going with all of this in light of the fact that I've been highlighting again and again in my, in my talk here uh, the very difficult position that we're in in terms of high debt levels for both the private sector and the public sector. Just to keep reiterating that every imaginable l measure of debt is very high, uh, if I haven't bored you already, is this is external debt. And consistent, remember what I said about the antecedents of financial crisis, that when you were borrowing a lot, it's not just borrowing domestically, you're also borrowing from the rest of the world. Well, the panel on the right shows debt to GDP in 2009, external debt. This is public plus private external debt. So this includes, how many of you are reading about the situation in Ireland? Okay, well, Irish external debts, this is not an exaggeration, are over 500% of GDP. Okay, this is, uh, and if you really want to see a record, I have not, in, in, in all the research I've done, I've not seen anything like Iceland. In Iceland, external debts reached 1,000% of GDP before the crisis. This is just, I have to say this, it's a small digression, but you know, how many of you have heard, you know, it's in the web, the Ig Nobel Prize in, okay, so the Ig Nobel Prize, the Ig Nobel Prize in economics in 2009 was given to uh, uh, four Icelandic ba bankers and supervisors for proving that they could take tiny banks and make them huge and then make them tiny again. <laughs> and so, um, at any rate, but uh, uh, the issue of external indebtedness, you know, when you also read about the difficulties that Ireland is facing or the difficulties that Spain is facing, often markets, you know, financial markets can lump everybody in the same bag, but the situation in Ireland and Spain is very different from the situation in Greece. Greek debts are primarily a problem of the, of the government. Irish and Spanish debts are a problem that the private sector borrowed a lot, but of course now the government is having to clean up the, the, the balance sheets of the banks. Um, so you also hear, gee, but emerging markets did so well this time. How is it that, you know, countries uh, that had been hit with such a big shock, especially in 2008 when many emerging markets saw huge declines in, in, in GDP and huge declines in exports. Remember the second chart uh, I put up. Um, how, how is it that they withstood this so well? Well, one, this is, there are many reasons, but one important one was Africa, Asia, and Latin American countries deleveraged a lot uh, in the run-up to the crisis. This panel here shows who reduced their external debts and who increased them. And I mean, think of a household. If in a household a person is takes a, a pay cut of the same magnitude, but your income, disposable income to mortgage payment ratio is already extremely high, then even a small pay cut can push you to, to default. Uh, you take the same pay cut for a household whose disposable income is a much higher ratio to the mortgage payment, and you can get by. What I'm saying is that the same shock applied to two countries that have a different degree of external leverage is going to have very different impacts. Uh, and a big policy concern for me right now, this is sort of moving now to the next phase of, and the final phase of my presentation so I can open up for questions and 
we have you know plenty of time of Q and A, um, is that right now you know people talk of Brazil as if Brazil has become Singapore in the last three months. You know, it's it's the this time is different syndrome has now moved to emerging markets. This is not new. This is you know um, um, the search for high yield. You know. Interest rates in the United States and interest rates in Europe and interest rates in Japan are close to zero. And so you investors start searching for places that offer higher rates of return. Emerging markets are offering those high rates of return. So, but it's, it makes it very tempting to issue debt for governments and corporations to issue a lot of debt when they are the darlings of the world. But that basically und undoes what actually kept them safe. So that I think th this this sort of you know boominess of emerging markets, which is a good thing, you 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 know because you you want more credit and so on. But uh, it um, it has a a potential threat attached to it as well. Now. Uh, my last point that I'd like to leave with you and before I open up for discussion has to do with how do governments get rid of such high levels of debt. The last time there have been, let, let me just say something about the last two times advanced economies have had this much public debt. Uh, the first of these two episodes. There have been other times in the 1800s, but I'll, I'll, I'll move on to this, the 1900s. was right after World War I. Right after World War I, there were lots of debts that were accumulated in the advanced economies. Um, let me say that there were the, the, the main tool for dealing with those debts was restructuring and default. And that applied pretty much to everybody. It, you know, when the Depression hit, in 31, 32, 33, there were very few countries that did not restructure or default. And that included the United States. The abrogation of the gold clause in 1933 was you had a treasury, a government treasury bond of the United States that said this is payable in gold. Okay? And then you turn around and say, well, no, this is no longer payable in gold. This is only payable in currency. But the gold content of the currency has plummeted. Okay, um, Standard and Poor's calls any any of those changes that are a change in contract that be, are less favorable to the creditor as a restructuring. So that, and I can go down the list, you know, and and talk about all kinds of restructuring issues. Um, also, uh, World War I debts were defaulted on. Uh, uh, the UK and France and Belgium did not pay, repay uh, US World War I debt. So default was a way of coping. That's not very attractive. Let's move on to World War II, and I'll close here. Uh, World War II debts to GDP were brought down importantly, and importantly, good growth during that period, rebuilding and so on. But part of it, the story was plain and simple what is called financial repression, which is nothing other than you have captive markets or debt, so you don't worry about rollover risk. Okay, With low interest rates, especially after tax, after inflation interest rates. We had negative interest rates in the US and the UK and in many advanced economies for extended periods. Not huge negative interest rates, but slight negative interest rates. But this was a way, actually, of financing debts because the alternatives are not pretty. Default is not pretty, and nobody likes fiscal austerity either. Financial repression is basically a series of taxes on the financial industry that ultimately get passed on and yield you know, a very slight to somewhat negative interest rates uh, on government debts, which you know, reduce, help cumulatively reduce the burden on the debt. 
And now, I'm not suggesting that we're going to have the Financial Repression Act of 2011 uh, coming up, uh, but I think the tendency towards uh, having a much more hands-on, we won't call it financial repression, we call it prudential regulation, uh, but in terms of creating large pools of holders of government debt at very low interest rates that can also be taxed to be even made lower interest rates is something that we are very likely to see because it's not just a U.S. problem, it's a problem for Japan, it's a problem for, for Europe, and so on. So <clears throat> let me open up the floor for, for questions. Uh, my name is Mahmoud Raya. Um, thank you for being here first. My question is, you mentioned that in the past, um, you know, we have seen this in the past, a lot of this isn't really new. Um, how can we make sure that we learn from, you know, the histories of history's lessons? And how can we make sure that laws and regulations that are put into place this time around are not repealed um, and forgotten like they're like that, you know, that has happened in the past? Thank you. Uh, somebody has to always ask this question. It's, uh, I, you know, I don't have an uplifting answer. I, I think, you know, we're going to keep doing this. Uh, uh, I, I, you know, I, 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 no, that's a truthful answer. I think, uh, look, the essence of this time is different, is these things happen to other people. You know, um, and memories fade. Uh, you know, the, the era before this crisis was called the Great Moderation, right? You know, and, and we thought we had tamed the business cycle. Um, you know, I think that um, over time, there is an ad the, a direct answer to your question. There is an advertisement that Ken and I chose to include. The historian, the economic historian Peter Linder sent it to us when he heard we were writing the book. That says, look, you know, we don't have to worry about um, um, you know investing in bubbles as in the past you know the ignorant investors of the South Sea bubble that's not going to be repeated you know we have accounting standards we can check balance sheet blah 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 this advertisement was published uh, in September of 1929 <laughs> um, I, I think I think memories are short, and I think because the crises, even though they follow very similar patterns, the instruments are not the same. The financial institutions are going to be a different group of players. The inclination to say, no, 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 that, that's passe. That doesn't happen with this kind of institution, or it doesn't happen with these kinds of instruments, or it doesn't plain happen to us. Um, that's human nature. I, I don't, I'm not optimistic. Oh, okay. Hi there. Uh, I was just going to ask about cultural uh, differences between countries and facing similar problems. For instance, you talk about Ireland and Greece. Uh, they're both faced with very similar uh, structural financial problems, but they've, um, they're facing up to the problems in a very different way. I mean, Greece has been faced with decades of uh, mismanagement and corruption in its political and economic infrastructure, but when they were faced with austerity measures and the IMF, there were radical strikes, there was violence in the street, there was, uh, uh, there was violence in, even in Parliament. Um, whereas Ireland, when they were faced with the same problem, they implemented cuts in healthcare, uh, education, right across the, um, the spectrum, cutting jobs in government, cutting salaries for all members of Parliament. Uh, but there were no strikes. There have been no strikes so far at all. And um, it looks like they're going to have to make more cuts. And again, they don't really think there's going to be any striking. So you could end up having, having a sort of a, a massive chasm between how countries react and uh, recover from this, from exactly the same problem. Do you see that sort of, that sort of as being true? Or do you think that um, do you think this isn't really the case? Um. I think there are significant differences in, in, in some of the, the, the work 
Um, I think there have been significant differences uh, in crises recovery. If Ireland didn't have the external private debts, it's as I as I highlighted the the main issue in Greece was public debts. The main issue in Ireland were the private bank debts. But now they've come to roost to the government, so the government's having to deal with it. The speed of adjustment and the, recon the speed of recognition of the problem is huge in terms about the speed of recovery. The let me highlight it not with two cases that are still unfolding, but compared to a case that happened a while ago, which is Japan. The main Japan problem was initially not a public sector problem, but a private debt problem, but one that it would not resolve. So unlike the Irish case, in which the, the reaction was, OK, we have to do this adjustment. We have to write down debts. Because an important element is debt write down. So if you have a lot of bad debts, keeping them on the books as zombie loans, which is something that you will hear me complain about the United States right now, um, is a delay of the recovery. It's a delay of the deleveraging. Uh, I think the greatest challenge for Ireland is not from the way it's reacted, which has reacted very swiftly uh, and very decisively. It's the order of magnitude that they inherited from, you know, the the, the boom in borrowing, which has made, you know, um, which is going to make also the adjustment, you know, longer. Had you had you had the same external private debts in Ireland as in Greece, because Greece, as I said, the main problem wasn't the private sector, but the public sector, um, so that the private debts were smaller, I think Ireland wouldn't be going through the second round right now. So what I'm saying is, in response to your question, response makes especially recognition of the bad debt problem has made historically an important difference between getting out of the crisis earlier, which bodes well for Ireland. The, what doesn't bode so well for Ireland is, is the magnitude of the private debts that were taken on during, during the boom, which were, were huge, the, the private bank debts. Um, the, by contrast of two crises that happened only a year apart, Sweden had a crisis in 91, Japan had a crisis in 92, Japan delayed, delayed, delayed. Uh, yet, really, no, no significant sign of recovery. Sweden had a really severe period. I mean, severe recession, you know, not rising unemployment, the whole deal. Uh, but it recovered much sooner. The Japanese zombie loan syndrome in terms of saying, no, no, we really fixed the balance sheet problem. Um, and that's an issue. Hi, on your, you had a very interesting uh, couple charts on the 10 years before crisis, 10 years after crisis, mm -hmm. and you showed two economic measures, uh, mm -hmm. GDP and unemployment. Uh, my question is two characteristics of those charts. The first is, uh, sometimes these crises can last uh, a year or more. I just wasn't sure whether you mm -hmm. included that period of time of the crisis at, in the pre or in the post distribution. And then the second thing is you sh the GDP frequency distribution was almost identical to the um, uh, for, in the pre and the post. And, and they're healthy. It's around 4% in the modes. Um, but yet the unemployment is very weak in the post mm -hmm while in the pre it's high. So how do you account for the divergence between the... Okay, uh, um, that's an excellent question. Let me first, let me deal with it backwards. Let me deal with it backwards. Um, uh, crises, uh, as I said, recovery and turning points, which is also why the NBR has faced quite a bit of dilemma in its dating the trough of the recession, they're not synchronous across markets, OK? So labor markets, uh, so exports, for example, in many of these crises, exports were an important source of rebound in the GDP numbers. That didn't necessarily translate 
to improved labor conditions, importantly because one of the early charts you recall that I showed was that 10 years after, real estate markets remained depressed in the decade after. R real estate in general, construction activity in general, is also very labor intensive. So, you know, uh, Advanced economies, by contrast to emerging markets, also have more rigid downward wages. So it, it you know, the it, the unemployment differences pre and post crisis are still important and, and negative for emerging markets in in the comparison, but not as negative as for advanced economies. And in part is because there's less, you know, downward rigidity in wages, and so. Uh, wage cuts and so on are, are, are uh, now on the pre and post and how do we treat it. We've done the exercise, the, the crisis year is excluded from the pre and from the post. The, many of the implosions are in that crisis year, so that's excluded from both distribution. We've also done it excluding a one year window on both sides, so that it's not contaminated, so to speak, by the immediate. And this is still very much the picture, but notice that what you have are negative fat tails. So uh, actually, if I were to show you the same chart, this is for the advanced economies, it's in the paper, for the Asian crisis countries, this is really worse uh, in terms of growth. Mm -hmm. Economists tend to uh, recommend that resources flow to their highest value use. And my question for you is, with international capital flows, you've suggested that they create more financial, potentially more financial instability. And uh, I guess I was wondering, do you, do you think that this hot money that's flowing around the globe is really a problem? And if so, what should be done about it? Uh, a tough question. Um um, the idea that resources flow into the more efficient also assumes away a lot of financial frictions that we know in reality and distortions, including moral hazard. Okay, so so the story that I've told about implicit guarantees, you know, it, it's. I, you know, one of the people that influenced a lot of my work was um, he's, he, he, he departed this world in, in the mid 80s, Carlos Diaz Alejandro, who wrote Goodbye Financial Repression, Hello Financial Crash. And it was also about um, uh, foreign lenders basically assuming that the government was going to step in and bail out whatever the private sector borrowed. That's a distortion. So I do think the issue of hot money is a problematic one. And um, if you look at the period of the 50s, 60s, 70s, where there were more uh, pervasive capital controls. I know capital controls has a bad name, but it's, it's you know, uh, Financial restrictions and trade restrictions are not the same thing. You know, restrictions on trade on goods and services is a very different animal from financial capital. Um, and you know, crises, financial crises were more rare. Uh, that what makes hot money a destabilizing force, as it has been in generating these crises, is that it's a feast or famine problem that it's not in small magnitudes, you know, that countries can absorb readily. It's, you know, uh, at the heyday before the Asian financial crisis, in one year, Malaysia, you know, capital inflows amounted to about 18% of GDP. That, that, I mean, that is just huge. Uh, so. The, the, the policy answer to your question is, I think the financial community, i.e. the IMF, among others, is recognizing that 
you know, some of the measures which were seen as no-nos in which countries tax, for example, short tripping, you know, short-term inflows, hot money, uh, that they were seen as, you know, not, not, you know, highly controversial. That's, that's, that's changing. Uh, I think the sequencing of financial crises that we've had associated with surges in hot money has, you know, uh, meant that there's a much more eclectic approach towards some kinds of capital account restrictions, even though there are many kinds of foreign capital, like foreign direct investment, that are still seen as highly conducive to growth. Um, the analysis that you present in the book, and you had a paper before that, and then the book came out, is 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 positive analysis, and 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 I think it's uh, th there's a typical divide we find in economics. It's positive and normative. It ultimately shakes down to that. And you, you use a lot of historical data, and, and you reveal patterns, I think, which are very useful, particularly between the Depression and, and now. Uh, I, but I think, what, what have we learned? If between 1930 and 2008, the same pattern in your chart that, that, you, that you showed has repeated itself, and we are, si we are at the cusp of looking at that, at that line, whether it's going to fall down, or stay up and then taper off or grow or you know whatever. What have you learned is, is the first part of the question, and and the second part of the question is, uh, what should we learn? What 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 are the normative implications of your analysis? Okay, the, the fair fair game. Um, let me answer the in order. The first, what have we learned? I think we've learned more about crisis management than crisis prevention. Okay. Um, the policy response, with all the errors that we've made along the way, to this crisis, I would say, has been far superior to the policy response of the 1930s. You know, in terms of macroeconomic policy, um, acting, you know, in the 30s, you had um, fiscal policy was a zigzag you know, a roller coaster. Monetary policy actually tightened, prolonging the crisis and exacerbating the crash. So at a minimum, I think we have learned something about policy response. We have not learned about crisis prevention, okay? Which I think, or, or I think some emerging markets have actually begun to learn about crisis prevention, at least while their memories are fresh. But I think their memories will also fade. And, you know, human nature is human nature, and they'll forget that and then go back to whatever. But before we get to the whatever, I think, let me answer the normative question. The United States and other advanced economies over the course of decades moved toward monetary policy as defined by the objective of price stability and, you know, some uh, counter-cyclical, uh, you know, we care about the employment gap, you know, the output gap, we care about employment. And importantly, the instrument had been short-term interest rates. And actually, if you look at the literature on monetary policy, it really gravitated towards reducing the monetary instrument to, to short-term interest rate. I think the normative is that, and this I've, I've spoken in various fora in, in, at the Fed and other central bank forums, is that from a not just a price stability stabilization perspective, from a global or even a domestic financial stability, as opposed to just price stability, financial stability, I think the array of instruments has to be expanded. And what do I mean? I don't mean we should go out chasing, popping asset price bubbles. I think that's just too, you know, too debonair. We don't know really much about whether it's a bubble or not. But 
we may not know what a bubble in asset prices looks like, but we sure know what debt buildups look like. And the debt data, the leverage data, is in the public domain. And if you look at a lot of the older instruments that monetary policy had, including things like margin requirements, which haven't been used counter-cyclically in at least 50 years in the United States, uh, it's time to really think about, you know, we won't call them reserve requirements, that's too old-fashioned. We can call them, you know, capital ratios and, and, and liquidity ratios and other things, but the, the main aim is focused on credit aggregates, leverage aggregates, and extend beyond the, I think that is a normative policy in terms of going along the route of prevention where we really evidently have not learned much. No, no. I, I think it's, you know, it's, it's very, uh, it's like what, you know, a Swift Pope, you know, uh, so Pope, huh? was it a modest proposal? Mm -hmm. um, I think that's, uh, you know, there, it doesn't really have that many teeth. Well, since I think that's probably the most optimistic note of the, <laughs> of the evening, we ought to stop there. And I want to thank Carmen for an absolutely terrific beginning to the Summer and Lecture Series. Thank you. Thank you.